You want the secret to being eight times more effective at cold calling? You want to meet the guy who actually invented the phrase, Sales 2.0? All that and more on today's episode of This Week in Sales. Hello and welcome to today's episode of This Week in Sales. I'm Kevin Gaither, the Director of Inside Sales at BetterWorks here in Santa Monica. You may recall the goal of the show is to help sales professionals with tips and tactics and techniques to help them improve their performance right now. Today's guest is Nigel Edelsheim, who's the CEO of Sales 2.0 LLC, which is the Sales 2.0 services company. Nigel, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Nigel, what's your nightmare sales job? Uh, I already had it, as I told you, Kevin. My nightmare sales job is uh, being what I call a sales monkey, which is making thousands and thousands of cold calls and getting no results. And I had that job, uh, and I had to think about how to do it better. Well, hopefully we'll dig into that a little, uh, a little bit further uh, today. So how about I uh, properly introduce you here. Nigel's the bloke that invented the term sales 2.0 uh, five years ago and even has a trademark on it, of course. Uh, Nigel Edelshane is the CEO of Sales 2.0 LLC. In that role, he is currently the guy responsible for bringing in the business for two small company clients as acting VP of sales in one case and head of department in the other. And in his spare time, of course, there's no spare time because he's got three little kids. I mean, please, let's get a hold of ourselves here. Uh, he coaches salespeople on how to seriously improve their game and writes his blog at sales2.com. Nigel has sold millions of dollars of IT solutions to major Fortune 500 firms, particularly for no-name brand startups that need to pen penetrate super big brand firms. And Nigel is a Wharton MBA and chairman of the school's Alumni Association in New York, serving 30,000 alumni, and has an undergraduate degree in microelectronics, microchip design, from Edinburgh University. So Nigel, once and for all, we've heard the phrase a thousand times. It's almost overused these days, <laughs> but what, 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 the heck is, what, what the heck is sales 2.0 and, and where did it come from anyway? Yeah, so let me answer backwards in my usual way. Uh, sales 2.0 came from my shower because I was a uh, frustrated sales guy. I had the nightmare job, right? I was cold calling, it wasn't working, and I was looking for ways to do my job better. And I'm an engineer, as you uh, introduced me, and I, I think in flowcharts. So I wanted a process, a sales process that worked really well. Um, and I was trying to figure out what it was. Um, so I went on a journey. You know, when I had the nightmare job, the first thing I did, being a sort of type A engineer, is I ran down to Barnes & Noble uh, in those days, no Amazon. And I grabbed the, you know, the sales books that were uh, out on the shelf to tell me how to do my job right and how to be a big success. Um, and I found that, you know, that started a journey that went on um, for years and years. And, I just want to know, how do you do this right? How do you make sales a repeatable process and, and you get successful as a sales guy? Um, and, I, and the journey took me you know, about 10 years and several years ago, about five years ago, as you correctly quoted, it, I was thinking, you know, what am I really up to? What's the big picture for my sales consulting company? Um, and it suddenly struck me in the shower, literally, uh, sales sucks. That's what I thought. Ah. Sales sucks. The way we do it sucks is what I really meant as an engineer. And I just wanted a phrase for that. Um, and because I'm a geek, because I'm an engineer, I was aware of Web 2.0. I said, hey, that'll be a cool name, Sales 2.0. So I just ran back, Googled it. In those days, there were like uh, six hits. So nobody was talking about it. So I said, I'm grabbing that. Um, and for me, uh, part of the reason I, I think I caused some of the confusion with the definition, and uh, for me, what it actually still stands for and stood for then is taking the sales profession to the next level. 
Uh, it's not or uh, wasn't as a as a mission all about tools um, uh, and technology, but it's uh, tactically today about using Web 2.0 and social media to sell. Just to actually answer your question, uh, but we're lucky because those tools, the internet came along, and those tools are available to us, and we can use those tools to take our game to the next level. Gotcha. So sales 2.0 originally was more of like how to enable salespeople to do their jobs that sucked, do it, uh, do it a little bit better. And if I understand you correctly, correctly, it's morphed into more of the application of web 2.0 tools and uh, uh, and social media to help salespeople improve their their performance. Right? Yeah. I mean that's where we're at today. You know, uh, it was sort of a bit lucky on my behalf, but those tools for the the rubber was hitting the road. You know on those tools round about the time I was having uh, great visions in my shower and uh, so you know those are the catalysts we have today to take our game to the next level those are extremely effective obviously we'll talk about that yeah excellent excellent well I, I'm gonna try and put the visions of you in the shower out of my head. I know I that know. I <laughs> read your uh, read some of your white papers uh, and attended your your webinars in years past. You refer to a phrase, social calling. What is social calling, Nigel? Yeah, so social calling is the prospecting part of the sales to work process to me. So back in the day, if we uh, get me out of my shower and take me back to Barnes and Noble, you know, the first books I found were uh, solution selling and spin selling, which, you know, got me tremendously excited and a great, great classic sales books, right? But, you know, I was in a small company. I was selling technology to Wall Street banks, the big companies. And what I realized suddenly in a moment of horror, having, you know, loved these books was that they assumed that I was in the buyer's office. And of course, I was nowhere near the buyer's office. I couldn't get any meetings. So what I realized is that, you know, prospecting, getting in the door was my biggest problem. And down this journey over the years of, you know, 10, 10 plus years, 15 years altogether, um, I've seen it time and time and time again with the, you know, particularly with small companies who I deal with a lot, that their biggest problem is getting in the door. So I've really focused, I really in the last, you know, three years focused my energy on the prospecting problem and came up with a framework I call social calling, which is my, you know, sales to a way to get it done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we talked about the, I guess, the keys or the elements of social calling. Will you run us through those, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. So uh, there's three elements to keep it simple, right? There's uh, who do you call, uh, which is the whole concept of having um, a tight prospect profile. So which companies do you call, like their size, their geography, their industry, all that really basic stuff. I think we, we kind of get that mostly now, um, but we don't have to think about, we need to think about more than just the companies. We need to think about the people that we need to sell to in those companies. And that's where I see salespeople uh, kind of coming a cropper on this first point of, uh, you know, who do we call, who do we sell to, who do we prospect? Uh, and there's some great research that I love that's been done over the last few years by a group called Marketing Sherpa. A lot of people may know, um, and if you don't, check them out. Uh, where they've actually gone to buying organizations and they've asked them, when you buy a piece of technology, you know, I do a lot of work in the, with technology sales forces and technology companies. And that piece of technology is more than $25,000 in value, which, you know, most of these things are, even for a small company. Um, if you're in a company of 1,000 employees or more, which is, you know, way more than the Fortune 1,000, maybe the Fortune 100,000, uh, how many people get involved in buying that piece of technology? They asked the buyers, remember? And the answer came back, 21. 21? 21, right? Jeez. Which is way bigger than any salespeople usually guess, you know? And you can argue, you can argue with the 21 number. The Financial Times of London has done a similar kind of a survey and they came out with about a dozen. But what I say to salespeople and sales managers and business owners is, okay, you want to argue between the 21 and the 12, that's fine. 
But it's not one, and it's not two, and it's not even three, right? In, in the bottom of the research, it's, it's 12. So what I see salespeople doing a lot is just prospecting into one person. And I've seen that in my own sales teams as well. You know, I had, I had a very well-intentioned new rep who, you know, worked all the time, worked really hard, made tons of phone calls, um, but only called the CIO at a, at a bank that we wanted to get into. And the result was no advance in the sale, right? No advance in the sales process because she never got through. Uh, you know, CIOs are typically very screened and uh, don't pick up their phone anyway. Um, and that person and many other sales reps, many, many other sales reps that I've seen have not thought about the other 20 doors that they might be able to get into. What are some examples of those other people? And I, and I love that, and I see that time and time again. They're just calling one person that they perceive. That's even worse, by the way. They call the one person that they perceive to be the decision maker, and they don't get return calls, and then they're like, well, I've tried to penetrate that account. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, yeah, there's exactly. plenty you know, of other I've people. I've found time and time again the biggest inflection point in maybe the whole sales process, even in this prospecting framework, is getting that first number one real conversation mm. with a human being, mm. you know? And I don't necessarily mean click, I'm in a meeting. I mean the first real conversation um, because that's where you get the first set of information. That's where you get the first scoop on what's going on. So, you know, typically um, I've sold things like trading systems to Wall Street banks, you know, big places like Goldman Sachs and so on. Um, those things, that there is a CIO and there's a whole bunch of you know technology guys who who look under the covers but there's also business people and one of my huge you know successes years back was just realizing that if you're selling a trading system you probably want to talk to the the guys who do the trading you know mm. um, and and things like that so you just have to think more broadly about who might be buying your technology um, and there are ways of breaking that down but but it's not one person Okay. All right. Good. So that's the that's the first piece. Who to call? And we actually have talked with yeah. Trish Bertuzzi in the past, and we've talked with Joanne Black in the past. And the constant message that that we get from time and time again is that being more specific about who we're looking for actually is going to increase our probabilities of uh, of success. So we've got who to call. Then what's next in our our well, yeah. success I just, uh, paradigm actually, I think here? For a jump into that, and I just want to mention the tools aspect of it. Okay. So, you know, what we have got now that, that we really didn't have several years ago, and I think we're kind of spoiled, um, once you've really nailed down, you know, the type of company that you want to prospect, and, and, and a good number of those titles, right, it's not one, it's not two, uh, that, you, that you can speak to to get that first real conversation and find out how that company buys your particular solution, your software or your service. Um, you can now go to tools that are right on your desktop, you know, over the internet. So, you know, now it's data.com from uh, Salesforce, but it was Jigsaw, right? Uh, you got Hoovers, you got Net Prospects, uh, you've got a whole raft of tools, DMV, Zoom Info, right? You're incredibly spoiled. And you, you know, back in the day when I, when I you know, was first learning uh, the problems with prospecting, it would sometimes take me a couple of weeks to find the right name of some obscure guy in a bank like Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. Now you can just drop into your Salesforce sometimes if you've got hooked up to data.com. The name could be sitting there for you. You know, you just need to know who you're looking for. So you can import that name in a couple of seconds. You can go into that prospects and download it in, in 30 seconds. It's amazing. And we get we get, you know, direct dial sometimes. We nearly always get the guy's email. Um, so once you know exactly who you're calling and the titles of those people, you can get the actual names and titles and phone numbers straight into your CRM. Perfect. So get clear on who you're calling, the titles, the demographics of the company that you're looking for, and then utilize these tools that are out there. They're going to, going to cost you money, but they're going to certainly uh, improve your, uh, your efficiency in going after who you need to go after. What's, uh, what's next? So next is uh, timing. Next is uh, something I call trigger events. I think many people have heard of that concept now. Mm -hmm. um, it's being 
in the buyer's environment when they have some kind of change going on in their environment because people in status quo who have you know everything's peachy i've got everything i want uh they're not going to buy from you you know they're they're in status quo but the people you want are the people in imbalance because if something changes in my environment that can ripple down to me needing a solution and that can be potentially your product or service so uh, what you want to do is want to be Johnny on the spot uh, as, I, as I call it you want to be calling at exactly the right time uh, having you know done your homework and having a sense of what kind of trigger events work for your particular business uh, you want to be calling into those companies at the right time and so trigger events are something now that at least the public ones you can monitor and track through these uh, you know quote sales 2.0 tools uh, right on your desktop as well so an example of a trigger event to make it you know a little clearer is and a very classic one is when new management comes in right when a new CEO comes in I sort of call them the uh, the new broom right they come in mm. and they sweep everyone out half of their the management that was there before gets swept out but also a lot of the vendors a lot of the incumbents uh, that you're competing against get swept out too so you want to show up at the time so if you're you know it depends on your on what you're selling but for example if you're selling to the marketing department you might want to know when they have a new head of marketing you know and you want to show up at that time and you can track those events things like executive changes really easily from your desktop now what are some of your favorite tools there? There's Google Alerts, but what are some of your other favorite tools? Google Alerts for the DIY people in the crowd. If yep. you like playing with keywords, uh, free of course, that's a great solution. But if you want to make it a bit easier on you or your reps, if you're a manager or business owner, uh, tools like Inside View, uh, I sell now from one source. These tools allow you to actually uh, you know, set up what kind of alerts and trigger events you want to track just with the click of a checkbox. Um, and I should mention there's other, kind of, other kinds of trigger events as well, such as people clicking on your emails um, that you can track uh, in tools such as Amicus that are really set up uh, to allow sales reps to know when, a, when their buyer's taken an action, which is also a very interesting kind of trigger event. Right, excellent. All right, so then what's the third element to, uh, to successful social calling? Well, it's the biggie. Uh, it's the biggie, you know. It's the one that means the most, I believe, and, and the one that, you know, makes the biggest difference. And I think for a while maybe we sort of forgot about it, but it's always, in fact, been the biggest thing in sales. Um, and that's relationships. And relationships have always been the reason people bought. You know, we buy from those we know, like, and trust, right? Mm -hmm. All things being equal, uh, and even if then they're slightly not equal, I'm still going to buy from the people I know, like, and trust. So yeah. what's changed in this department is that, again, we have amazing tools because of the advent of social media. And so there's always been a thing that Mark Zuckerberg, the, the a chap who's about to make unknown billions, like I don't know how many billions it is, on Facebook, coined the, uh, the social graph. And that's the concept that we're all connected by relationships. And what's changed is we can now, as I call it, shine a light on those relationships. We can actually see who our friends know. And before we had tools like LinkedIn and Facebook and some tools now in the sales to our world that have been bent, uh, built on those, uh, it was hard to know who you knew, Kevin. You know, my only way to do that was to ask you to come to the coffee shop and bring your actual physical Rolodex, if you remember those. Mm -hmm. And then when we got high tech, it was for you to bring your Palm Pilot and we would scroll through it for half an hour looking for names that might be useful to me. Now, I can go onto LinkedIn and I can say, you know, a couple of different ways, but I can say, I want to get into Goldman Sachs. And lo and behold, it will show me everyone who's my uh, intermediary, it will show me all the people in Goldman Sachs I can get to as second degree connections. And it will show me, oh, look, my friend Kevin is actually the one in the middle. And he's the guy who can refer me to that guy at Goldman Sachs. 
Um, and that changes everything because now I don't have to cold call anymore. Uh, I can get a referral from my friend Kevin to the, to the guy I want at Goldman Sachs and get a warm intro. And that's the biggest one of all. It always has been, but now I can do it on scale. I can do it from my desktop. And I can see very easily uh, the people you know to the extent that you're connected to them on LinkedIn. Uh, time out, Nigel. A couple of weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving, we had Joanne Black on the show. Yes, and I, know, John. I, I love Joanne. Yeah, No More Cold Calling uh, being her, her book, of course. And she was emphatic. She said, there is no such thing as a warm call. It's either really, really hot or it's really, really cold. There's nothing, uh, nothing in between. Uh, if Joanne was sitting here today, what would you say to that? Well, you know, um, I don't get that hung up on semantics because I'm an engineer, so I actually think about numbers, you know. Um, my, my one thing about referrals I am very clear on is that in, back in the day, we used to just talk about getting referrals from your customers, um, and that was, that's great, you know. If you can get referrals from your customers, that's a great thing, right? They're using your product, uh, great referral. But I don't limit it to your customers because when I've been in sales, I find that incredibly limiting. So what I'm saying here is use the social graph uh, to get referrals from anyone, whether it's you know your uncle, your aunt, your hairdresser, anyone who has trust with the party you're trying to get to and trust with you is going to increase your chances of getting into that company uh, you know, many fold, you know, whether it's 5x, whether it's 7x, or it's, you know, 8x, like I talk about with this whole social calling framework. Um, I, don't, I don't really get hung up on whether it's super hot or super cold. Uh, I get hung up on how much more money I can make, how many more accounts I can get into. Um, and as an engineer, you know, if you can get even 2x improvement in the process, that's pretty damn amazing. So, you know. Okay. Speaks for I itself. Take it. <laughs> yeah, you'll take 2x, <laughs> right. All right, fair enough. So, you know, a lot of sales managers that are probably watching the show right now are probably thinking, oh my God, I got another guy out there that's advocating that my salespeople get on Facebook and LinkedIn and be screwing around all day. Uh, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> so, what do, you, what, what do you, how do you speak to that? Well, you know, it's, um, we're always uncomfortable with new technology, right? It comes along and at first we, we sort of, a certain amount of us are, are not early adopters and, and we don't want to, we don't want to go there, we're kind of scared. And, you know, um, some of these tools, as I've been explaining for, you know, 50 minutes or so, are huge uh, productivity results. Uh, enhancement tools, right? So they're just going to help you sell a lot more and be a hero, uh, Mr. Sales Manager that we're talking to in this case. And, um, you know, you don't want to shut those off. You know, you don't want to shut off. You, you probably don't want to take cell phones away from your salespeople now, you know. So you don't want to take away LinkedIn. And yes, you have to be careful because I'm not advocating that we all go on Facebook uh, and spend our day there, you know, uh, playing fantasy football, right? But if we go onto these tools and use them to sell more, uh, you know, do it. Right. All right. Um, I know I've had experience with sales managers uh, in the past, uh, and I know there's probably also some sales managers out there that feel that perhaps their salespeople are actually hiding behind these tools as opposed to like, having some meaningful conversations. I mean, I had a sales manager one time when email just came about. I mean, I had to configure their, the email, by the way. It was me, a sales guy. I had to configure it. Yeah. And as I was trading emails with my potential prospects and customers, you know, he came in. This is, you know, he'd smoke in the office. He'd say, Kevin, you're hiding behind the emails. Just get on the phone with these people and stop wasting time. So then I shut my fantasy football down and, and made some calls. So um, I'm kidding, of course. Um, no, I know. But, but what would you, um, do you feel that salespeople nowadays, because of all these tools, that they actually hide behind these sales 2.0 tools? Um, you know what, it's, um, it's down to working practices. I've actually uh, seen both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. 
So, you know, obviously what I'm advocating is using tools effectively. Um, I'm a huge time management freak in reality. So, you know, for me, it's how do I get a result um, in the limited, limited amount of time that we all have. And as you said at the beginning, I, I'm particularly attuned to. So uh, I've seen salespeople who, you know, could hide behind these tools. But I've also seen salespeople who refuse to, you know, use these tools or aren't using these tools. And I think there's more people in that camp right now still. Um, and they're not getting the benefit. And if they're just cold calling, they're basically doing, in my opinion, they're doing well, today, they're doing more of what doesn't work. Um, and you know the definition of that. So it's not working. Let's do more of it. Very good, very good. Uh, hopefully down the line, I'm going to get Coca Sexton on the show, who uh, yes. runs Social Selling University through uh, Inside View, and he is certainly one of the guys out there that would, it would be a tool freak and has seen success and actually developed quite a brand uh, for himself. So Coca, you're out there. You're coming on the show next year for sure. Um, Nigel, I want to wrap up here with a couple of things. Uh, first, a summary of the, the three elements of social calling here. We want to make sure that we get really clear on who we're calling, not only from the, a company level, but also from a, a title level and a person level, and make sure that we're calling multiple people. Uh, the second piece and second element of uh, successful social calling is making sure that we're calling at those trigger events, change in leadership, new product announcements. Um, we uh, mentioned uh, several of these uh, you know, are already, of course, and that gives us the right time to call. And then the, the third success for social selling is referrals, making sure that you're doing business with, uh, with people that know you. So using LinkedIn as an example, seeing who you're connected to, and, uh, and getting a referral to that person through people that you already, uh, already know. I actually referenced you on a show a couple of weeks back when I said, you advocate actually making that online connection offline, like a five minute call, just to make that connection real so that when you need to call upon that person to ask for that referral, there's some, some basis in the offline world, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the people in the, in uh, my LinkedIn connections are real people. They're real relationships. They're not just somebody who sent me a LinkedIn invite. So there's a whole aspect to maintaining your network, whether it be uh, online or offline, which is people are only going to help you if they like you, right? And right. to like you, there has to be some sense that we stayed in touch. And it actually doesn't take that much, but salespeople... Um, I feel if you're a professional salesperson and you want to stay in this game for a while, uh, investing in your contacts is a mighty wise thing to do. Yep, absolutely. We're going to have the Brooks Group on the show uh, next week, and uh, the founder of the Brooks Group actually said at one point in time, it's better to be trusted than to like, to be liked. So make those, uh, make those online connections offline so there's some trust there. Uh, last question for you, Nigel. If you were stuck on a desert island... What sales 2.0 tools would you take with you? Yeah, so I mean, the, the big daddy is really, you know, LinkedIn. I use, I, I live on LinkedIn. Um, I have to take that one first. And then I would, you know, that give me my, my referrals and it give me a few other things. I would definitely take uh, Inside View. So Coca will be pleased with me and hopefully send me some money after the show or at least a bottle of wine. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then I, I need some, you know, I'd probably take a data provider. So whether it be uh, maybe data.com now through Salesforce, because we're all living on salesforce.com anyway. So I'd take a tool for each, each leg of social calling with me. Excellent. Very good. Well, Nigel, that's all we have for this week. Uh, Nigel Edelshane, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Wonderful. So if you have any questions for me, feel free to email me at askkevin at thisweekend.com. Of course, like our Facebook page, This Week in Sales. Tweet at us at Sales Week. And of course, you can find this on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash show forward slash This Week in Sales. And of course, don't forget to download our iTunes podcast as soon as possible. And so that's all we have for this week. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned next week where I've got Jeb Brooks from The Brooks Group, a top 20 sales training company according to Selling Power magazine nonetheless. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week.